Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right, good. Well, I'm Eric Stuckey. I'm the city administrator of the city of Franklin, and it is my privilege to welcome you today to the state of the city. And we're so thrilled to have people together here in person to talk about our community, what has happened in this most unusual year, but also what's coming forward and what we need to look forward to as we, as we advance in 2021. I want to first thank the Franklin High School band members that we have with us. We have a saxophone quartet. Thank you all. They'll be providing music for us through the day. And let me introduce them specifically. I feel like I'm making the introductions at a basketball game. Starting at Soprano Sax. No. Soprano Sax, we've got uh, Alexander uh, Bartholo. Bartholo, sorry about that. William Richmond on alto sax. Nathan Fisk from uh, tenor sax and Aiden Cook, baritone sax. Thank you all. So I wanna make a quick introduction uh, as we uh, move into our program here. Uh, got to make an appointment this last year and I have some hard decisions in my job, but this wasn't one of them. We got to appoint uh, Glenn Johnson who served as 27 plus years in the Franklin Fire Department as our fire chief. And so in recognition of that, yes, Glenn, come on up. I'm uh, going to have Glenn lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance. And I also want to invite members of our Franklin Police and Fire Departments to come forward in the Honor Guard to present the colors. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Again, I want to thank uh, the men and women of the Franklin Police Department and Fire Department for the service they provide us every day and the Honor Guard that helped us with that important component of our program today. Couple, thank you. Couple quick logistics for you. Hopefully you've gotten some lunch. Please be seated. Hopefully you've gotten some lunch. If you haven't, there's still food back there. There are uh, 
restrooms if you need them straight towards the parking garage where you see the the ladder truck and the american flag go in that direction you'll find the restrooms if you need them those lovely uh seat cushions that you're sitting on are yours to keep so that's a little a little giveaway for you so you got that we've also got these um lemon stress balls so if you want want, want these you can squeeze the lemon no, no juice will come out but it'll relieve some stress so anybody want one of these all right, here we go. Oh, bad throw, sorry. We'll have to weight them down a little bit and get a little more distance on them. All right, no, I, I need to introduce the mayor. This is the state of the city. He's the star of the show, right? And it's budget time though, so I'm focused on numbers. So he is the 31st mayor of Franklin, the second physician that has served as mayor of Franklin. This is his 11th state of the city but his 10th state of the city in person last year was, you know, kind of virtual. So without further ado, join me in welcoming Dr. Kenmore, our mayor, to the stage. Wow. What a great crowd and what a great opportunity and just want to welcome everybody. And, and I bet many of you, this is the first time you've been at a, an event where you actually saw people and you've seen people. They're folks you haven't seen since last year. So enjoy and thank you for being here today. Uh, I need to uh, thank our host, Franklin Park. This is part of their uh, business complex, this amphitheater, and they've been generous enough to donate this to us today. I do want to recognize the First Lady of Franklin, who's sitting on the front row, my wife, Linda. I want to thank, uh, we have elected officials here today. I know if you're from the county, other than Mayor Anderson, and you're a county elected official, I'd like to recognize you, so raise your hand. And if you're a state elected official, and if you're a city alderman, please uh, let me recognize you, raise your hand, and welcome, and thanks for the hard work you do. I see a few. I want to thank the uh, Franklin Breakfast Rotary Club, my Rotary Club, uh, who donated the lunch. Thank you. And lastly, there are a lot of volunteers that came out earlier this morning to start prepping for this, and uh, I just can't thank them enough for the energy that they've put into making this a great event and what a unique event it is uh, for all of us. You know. 2020, needs, needless to say, was a very, very tough year for all of us. But I particularly want to call out the hospitality industry and our restaurants who struggled through this time because we were all uh, in pandemic mode. Our women and men of the police and the fire department who this was an added stress to them to be in the pandemic and worried about their health while at the same time responding to calls. And also the isolation that we've experienced for our seniors and also our kids, uh, not knowing one day whether they'd be in school or not and just lacking that socialization, which uh, is so important. And of course, mentioning mental health in our community, which I'll talk about a little bit later, how this has been a real stress on all of us, and it's a real relief to just be out and about today and see each other. Behind me, there are 217 flags. Those flags represent the deaths from COVID in Williamson County. And I'd ask that you stand with me for a moment of silence to recognize those that we lost during the pandemic. And thank you.
Well, from the very beginning of the pandemic, when the first case was diagnosed in Williamson County in March of 2020, I, along with the city's leadership team and communications, uh, were in the, along with the city's leadership team and communications folks, were in meetings daily with each other, with our partners at the county, our neighboring cities, and the state. This truly was a unified response on the part of everyone in Williamson County, including the Emergency Management Agency. I'd like to welcome to the stage County Majors Mayor Rogers Anderson and our Emergency Management Agency Director, Todd Horton. Give him a hand. Welcome. Thanks for being here. I hope you had a good lunch. And uh, what a great day and great opportunity to have you here. And Rogers, uh, we've had a great relationship for a long time, but the pandemic uh, only strengthened some of those relationships and partnerships that we have between the cities and towns in uh, Williamson County. I'd like for you to talk a little bit about all the meetings that we had uh, with all the leadership and uh, folks throughout Williamson County and the state during the pandemic? Well, first of all, thanks a lot for being invited here, and you're doing a great job to keep up the good work. If you go back to March 5th of 2020, when we had our first acknowledged case of COVID-19 in our county, unfortunately for me and my family, I had an oldest son and his wife and three kids living with me, and he was case number three or four. And so early on, I got a dose of that. And it was just a few days later that one of your speakers you're going to have up, Dr. Andy Russell, uh, came out and said, don't know a lot about it, but here's what we're doing. And so we got busy working with Kathy and emergency management and working with Todd and then over a period of just a couple of days, the executive orders that were coming out from the governor's office, you could see that this conversation needed to be very broad. And, and so through your efforts, uh, all of the, we have six cities in our, in our county. And so we got all six cities together. We had all the city managers of the six cities. We had all the legal folks that we could get on these virtual calls, Todd, Bill Jorgensen uh, from the uh, Public Safety Department, and we talked about the different issues that we were all facing, and we communicated openly. In those early days, there were three calls a week, or an hour to an hour and a half a day, all times of the day, trying to come up with a consensus of how we were going to address this. So it wasn't just one individual, myself, it wasn't any one entity, it was all of us collectively coming to, to a consensus at the end of the day. And I must say, Rogers, you look good on Zoom. <laughs> Todd, um, you've been working closely with the health department to provide testing and vaccine logistics. Explain to uh, the crowd here today the work that goes on behind the scenes to provide these services to the citizens. Well, thank you, Mr. Moore, and thank you also for the invitation to be here. Um, early on, we knew that this pandemic was not going to go away anytime soon, and we knew all the challenges that we were going to face, or at least most of the challenges that we were going to face in the need to deliver uh, both testing and vaccination process. So the first logistical effort was to find a venue uh, that would suit the needs of the community, uh, that would last through all types of weather to the best of its ability, that would provide the safety for not only our staff, but also uh, for the public and, and provide also the flow of information that needed to go through the center. So it was no question in our mind that the Williamson County Ag Center was the best location for this venue. And with the mayor's approval, it has served uh, the, the county well. <clears throat> After you find a venue, then you've got to develop the plan. Uh, and the plan involves not only the interior layout of the facility, but also the exterior layout, which includes the traffic management component. 
uh, thousands of vehicles intended to come through this site every single day uh, require some logistical work. And so in times of disaster, we don't have all the resources in any one government entity. So it's important that we have the partnerships that both mayors spoke about and the relationships that we can share resources with one another. And the city of Franklin stepped up in a big way and helped provide us with jersey bearers, with cones, with digital messaging boards, and other items to help facilitate the traffic management component of this exercise. In addition, there's a lot of logistics that go into the personnel that have to staff and operate a center like this. At the height of the pandemic, we were running close to 60 people to manage this one site uh, across Williamson County. And so the city of Franklin stepped up and provided Franklin fire personnel, paramedics that helped us with the vaccination administration, as well as the Brentwood Fire Department, and also medical monitoring and support for those getting vaccinations. They provide, both cities provided law enforcement officers to support the sheriff's department and security. And then of course, there's the logistics that our local health department did, uh, the logistics of personal protective equipment and maintaining vaccine and supplies in order to deliver the amount of testing and vaccinations that was happening. And then we had a big component with, this was a, an information need to know by our public. So we had all of our public information officers across the municipalities and the county government working together every day to ensure consistent message and messaging that was appropriate for our community specifically. And then the city of Franklin also supported a lot of support in helping man and staff a call center that was vital to many of our elderly population who are not able to facilitate computer usage very effectively in some cases. And so this call center helped provide them a quick way to get accurate information and help in registering for the vaccine and testing. So that's just a snippet, Mr. Mayor, of, of some of the logistics that go into this event. We're grateful to the city of Franklin for its partnership. Well, and I think you're exactly right. It is just a snippet. Uh, just barely touching the surface of how much really went on and how much uh, planning went into effect. Rogers, uh, we, we also worked very closely with the state on this, and um, I know that the state looked at a lot at what we were doing here in Williamson County, but talk just a little bit how we worked with the governor's office. That's an excellent point, and one of the things that I failed to mention, that we also had the school personnel, Franklin Special School District, and the Williamson County Public Schools, the superintendents on these calls to help make those decisions in those early days. Later on in the discussion directly uh, answering your question, um, oftentimes we'd have a phone call from, from the governor to one of us or to our group, but more, more in more case, it was, uh, a, it was What's their next step? When are they going to do it? How can we get it organized? How can we get the message over to Todd so that we can get this um, entire program rolled out uh, so that it, uh, it's not just total chaos? Because you have to remember so many of the, the cities and the counties, uh, we've, we had never gone through anything like this. And, and likewise for the state. Our first uh, vaccine site was actually on West Main. It was a total mess. Um, the governor came down with automatically that brings a whole bunch of press down and uh, the press wasn't getting tested they were getting pictures and the cars were lined up on West Main and it didn't take long like Todd said we had to find some other place to go and the Ag Center was the place we we finally settled on but in those early days you and uh, Ken you and and so many of the other uh, folks uh, the city managers helped and in, in, in quite frankly I like to think that Middle Tennessee was looking at a lot of the things that we were doing and some of the suggestions and then of course behind the scene we had the, the legal folks giving us what we could do and we couldn't do and we're indebted to them because there are so many moving parts to these executive orders and um, you had to get it right so thank you Ken for organizing and to Eric and to all of those city mayors and city managers out there that came to the table because um, it was a, a real show of leadership. Well, and I think everybody looked to the uh, leadership of our county mayor, Rogers, and the great job that you did in, in a situation that none of, us, none of us had ever experienced. And Todd, this is what you train for every single day. and. Uh, it was exemplary how you responded. So thank, thanks for coming up and uh, giving us some insight. And um, give them a hand.
Todd mentioned uh, the uh, testing that went on during the pandemic, and uh, it certainly was long and arduous, and now we're actually into the vaccine phase, and we have two folks here with us who have led those efforts in Williamson County and Williamson Medical Center. So welcome to the stage, Kathy Montgomery, Director of the Williamson County Health Department, and Dr. Andy Russell, Chief Medical Officer from Williamson Medical Center. Kathy, it has been a long year, and where are we now with the vaccinations? Well, it has been a long year, and I just want to back up just one second if I can and uh, talk just a second about our PCR testing and our uh, COVID self-test kits that we distributed. I can tell you that since March of last year, our health department has already done 60,000 tests. And for Williamson County residents, for non-residents, we had people from other states that came through. And again, I can't say enough thanks to uh, emergency management and Todd Horton for the great facility and Mayor Moore for the great facility we have to be able to do this. So in December, when vaccines rolled out and certainly hospitals and health departments were the first to receive uh, vaccine to start vaccinating our residents. Um, you know, we started vaccinations then, and then the state did, I thought, an outstanding job onboarding other providers and uh, pharmacies and healthcare workers and so forth to be able to do vaccinations to help us. Uh, Mercy Community Healthcare is another great um, example of who is doing vaccinations in our community. Uh, we have had the privilege of working beside National Guard, but beside contract uh, health care workers, uh, paramedics, and of course our health department team to do vaccines out at the Ag Center. These people have worked tirelessly. They have worked weekends, holidays. They have worked extended hours, and to date, we have already completed over 85,000 vaccinations out at the Ag Center, just from the health department. Um, this has really led to, and I'm happy to report this, that over 41% of our county residents have been fully vaccinated, and 47% have had at least one dose. So pretty incredible and thanks to our partners thank you Andy welcome to the stage a lot a lot of people may not know you without your scrubs on and uh, maybe a mask uh, but we thank you for all the work you've done during the pandemic and can you uh, explain how the hospital prepared for uh, the pandemic and what the response was sure uh, first of all, thank you very much for asking me to be here, and I want to thank everybody in the community for all the support that you've given us throughout the last 15 months or so, from cakes and cookies and meals that you've delivered to the hospital to all the thoughts and prayers. Those have all been felt and very much appreciated. Um, again, since it started last March and the first uh, known case of COVID in Tennessee was right here in Williamson County, we immediately began making plans for an unknown amount of patients that would come in. Um, we didn't know if that would be 10 or 100 or 1,000 or what, but we started planning for the worst immediately. Um, we formed a COVID task force that began meeting daily, and we met daily for almost six months before we finally took a day off. Uh, we finally have cut that back and not having to meet every day, thank goodness. Um, we initially began moving patients around within the hospital to create more space. We ultimately had to move entire departments within the hospital to create even more isolation areas where we could provide the good safe care that these patients need and also to continue to provide safe spaces for other patients who are there who don't have COVID. Um, we had uh, many of our staff members even volunteered to work in, in the COVID units, putting themselves uh, at risk and we're most appreciative to them. Uh, we spent a lot of time developing new HR policies to help with staff who were out either with uh, COVID themselves or if they had sick family members who were home. Um, we increased our telemedicine capabilities to help do virtual visits um, and not have to bring people into the hospital and into offices if they didn't have to be. And throughout all this, 
uh, Williamson Medical Center and our outpatient clinics have treated over 2,800 COVID patients. Out of those, over 1,100 have had to be admitted to the hospital. And, and these are not short hospitalizations. The average person with COVID is in the hospital for almost six days. We've had several that have been out there almost two months. Um, and even though the numbers have, have begun to decline, we're still very much in this pandemic. We still have a fair number of patients in the hospital. We have several in our ICU this morning. We're still seeing multiple patients every day with COVID in the uh, emergency department. The quickest way for us to get uh, out of this is, is for the vaccines. And while Kathy uh, mentioned that we're at over 41%, uh, that's fantastic. To reach this herd immunity that everybody's heard about, we need at minimum 70%. Uh, other estimates are go as high as 90% of, of the population to receive the vaccines. Luckily, the CDC has kind of relaxed guidelines here lately for those who have received vaccines. Um, but for those who have not been vaccinated, they still need to wear masks and socially distance and, and those sorts of things in order to prevent more infections, more hospitalizations, and more death from COVID. Um, speaking of the vaccines, again, these vaccines have been shown repeatedly to be safe and effective. Uh, across the hospital system, we've seen zero patients that have had serious adverse, uh, adverse reactions to the vaccines, and we've not admitted a single person for treatment of COVID that has uh, completed the vaccine process. Uh, I do uh, want to thank everybody here who has gotten vaccinated because that not only protects you, it protects those members of the community who cannot get vaccinated either they're too young to get the vaccines or they have allergies or other medical problems that preclude them. And so by you getting vaccinated, it helps protect them. And for those who are hesitant about getting the vaccine and have not yet taken the vaccine, I encourage you to talk to your doctor, talk to your medical providers uh, about the vaccine, let them be a source of your information. They know a lot more about this than what you're gonna find on Facebook or Google or anything like that, I promise. Uh, and I'm ha I'll stick around afterwards to answer any questions that anyone might have as well. Uh, but please talk to your doctor if you have any questions or concerns about the vaccines. Uh, and finally, as we try and get back to normal, I wanna encourage everybody to, to get back to your routine uh, health care. I know a lot of people had appointments for annual checkups or mammograms or colonoscopies or those sorts of fun things that were put off or rescheduled from last year, but we can't forget about those things. So I encourage everybody to, to get those rescheduled uh, because that helps us provide the best care for you and it helps you to get back to living your healthiest lives. Thank you for those comments, Andy, and uh, just really appreciate the work that you and Kathy do for our community. Uh, either one of you have a comment, uh, or both of you if you'd like, a uh, comment about what to look forward to the rest of 2021? Well, we know that the vaccine has been approved now for 12 to 15 year olds, and uh, we strongly would like to encourage those parents and, and adolescents uh, to go ahead and get their vaccination before the school year. Um, this will definitely reduce quarantines if there is exposure or close contacts for individuals. Um, and I think probably one of the biggest things we learned from all this, Mayor, is that um, aside from COVID, whether it's flu or any other kind of uh, respiratory diseases that are infection is just to wash your hands frequently, stay home when you're sick, and um, continue to wear a mask if you're not fully vaccinated. Exactly. I agree 100% with everything Kathy just said. Um, again, it's going to take more of us to get vaccinated. Again, at 41%, that's fantastic. We need to double those numbers, though, before we can really start to feel safe and that this pandemic is almost over. So again, we're heading in the right direction, but we're not at the finish line yet. So I encourage everybody to remain vigilant. Again, washing hands and those things are good even when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. Well, just thank you again for everything you've done and uh, appreciate everything. And thanks for being here today. Well, it's my privilege now to invite uh, Eric Stuckey, our city administrator, who you uh, saw just a few minutes ago, uh, to come up. And I'd like for Eric to talk about some of the lessons uh, that we've learned in 2020. And we'll also talk about some of the accomplishments despite the uncertain economy and the pandemic. And also, we'll talk about some of the projects that may have slowed your ability to get here today. <laughs> so, Eric. Let's make some lemonade. All right, let's do it. 
Well, thanks. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for being here. And uh, just to reflect and, and just, you know, we talked a lot about pandemic, but uh, the, the impact of that sort of experience, you can't help but be changed by it individually and as a community. So the decision is, are you going to come out of it better and stronger? Or are you going to go the other way? Well, we made a very intentional decision to be a stronger Franklin coming out of this, and that's something we've talked a lot about as a leadership team. And so we reflected on that and said, what are our lessons learned? And, and first of all, you saw some of that here, that the relationships that we have with one another really make a difference. And, uh, you know, all the meetings, all the things that Kathy and Andy and uh, Mary Anderson and Todd talked about are true. We build on that. but. Because we had strong relationships to begin with, we could hit the ground running and work issues and challenging problems that none of us had all fully experienced together. So uh, that ability to have those relationships, to adapt, to be resilient was critical. And I think those are lessons that carry forward for us uh, as we move, move along. And again, our, our stronger Franklin um, framework is about four Ps. I uh, love alliteration. Of course, pandemic continues, so we got to continue to be guided by public health and medical experts' guidance there, and that's not going to stop. Um, but it's about people, taking care of the people of our community. We're in the people business. We serve our community, but also taking care of our, our team, uh, their needs, uh, mental health, all those elements are, are critically important. Uh, projects. We still are one of the fastest growing cities in America. We have projects we need to deliver on so that we can respond and maintain the quality of life that we have grown to expect and want to build on every day in Franklin. And then finally, possibilities, being capable to take advantage of what comes our way. The opportunities have the capacity, yes, financially and otherwise, to seize those opportunities that come our way. So that, that, that's really, the, I think, the takeaways uh, that we, we have uh, learned as a community and as a city team. Well, those are great comments and great points you made. And uh, uh, I think we'll shift gears just a little bit uh, and maybe uh, have a little bit of fun. <laughs> and uh, we've got the Pilgrimage Festival coming back this fall. And uh, representing them today is uh, Mary Pierce, who many of you know. And she's going to come up and uh, chat about that just a second and uh, maybe give something away, right, Mary? Well, the Pilgrimage Festival's amazing. Uh, it's a huge cultural and musical event, and we're proud to be back on September 25th and 26th. And I'm representing today the very hip and capable um, lead dog for Pilgrimage Festival, Brant Wood, who couldn't be with us. And we've always at this festival tried to make it a give back to the community with partnerships. And so today, under one of your yellow seats, uh, there are a pair of pilgrimage tickets for two days. So somebody's a lucky winner out there. Check out your seat cushion. We oh, found okay. them. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Yay. Well, the tickets are selling faster than ever. <laughs> and for the people that are seeing this virtually, uh, if you will uh, go to the comment section and put tickets, you will also have the opportunity to win a pair. Great, great. Say that one more time, what okay. they have to do. If you are online uh, watching this virtually, uh, in the comment, type in tickets, and we are going to give two more tickets away through a drawing to someone who's watching online. Great, great. Good. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Mary. And Eric, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we look forward to a great oh, festival. So <laughs> That's great. Well, 2021 truly is looking like uh, we're making some lemonade. From 2020 and uh, looking back on 2020 we got a number of awards and uh, the first one was the All-American City we were one of ten cities recognized by the National Civic League for our work uh, and uh, we cooperated or partnered with Franklin Tamara to gain that honor 
and we're always interested in uh, how we do financially and how we're responsible. And again, we're a triple A rated uh, bond by both Moody's and Standard and & Poor. And continuing on that theme, we again received the Distinguished Budget Award from the Governor's Finance uh, Officers Association. Uh, Every other year we do a citizen survey and uh, we received a number of awards uh, from the National Research Center uh, for the responses that our community provided. And finally, Money Magazine, which you all know, uh, this is the third time in a row that we've been in the top ten for one of the best places to live in America. So I think we should applaud each other for those accomplishments. And Eric, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some people may have had a little struggle getting here because of some traffic and orange cones and so on. And I'd like to maybe uh, talk a little bit about what projects are currently underway and some finished dates. Uh, so can you talk sure. about those? I, they certainly haven't stopped during the pandemic. Well, there's a lot still going on, as you can tell, and actually, it reminds me, five years ago at State of the City, we talked about dedicating a dime of our property tax to what we call Invest Franklin, which was specific investments in our community to help us leverage uh, projects. And from that sprung about $340 million of committed projects in the next 10 years. And so we're working hard to deliver on those, and I'll reflect on just a couple highlights that you can look forward to in the year to come. Uh, the long-awaited Mac Hatcher Northwest Extension will be completed this fall. So that's a great one, one we've all been waiting for. So uh, uh, we're very, very thankful for that and our partnership with TDOT and the local investment that helped spur that project on after many years of waiting. Fire Station 7 is now open and operating. Uh, earlier this month, we put firefighters in place. Uh, this is also a joint partnership with Williamson County. We've got paramedics also operating out of that, will be operating out of that fire station in one of our fastest growing areas of town in the southeast part of Franklin, down at Fire Station 7. So that's great work and a great partnership. Uh, I think what the mayor might be referring to a lot of a disruption with Franklin Road is that is pushing forward. Uh, that, that is a great project though that will help create a connection between downtown and Harlansdale and the factory and the networks of trails and sidewalks that go out all the way here to Cool Springs. So that project is well underway and we expect to see that completed uh, by next summer. Uh, one of the creative things we did with that project is we've created a, an incentive for that contractor to deliver that within 18 months. And we'll see, they're, they're pretty dedicated to hitting that target. So uh, we'll, we'll see if they deliver on that, but we realize that there are impacts to the community, impacts to us, and it's well worth, us, worth it to maybe incentivize those quicker delivery times. Uh, 96 West Trail, uh, that is underway and will be completed by the end of this year. That, takes the trail system that we started a few years ago along 96 West, takes it all the way from the campus of Freedom, uh, Freedom Middle and Poplar Grove all the way into downtown uh, and will be a great connection and a great way to give you an option to get to and from downtown without hopping in your car. And we find wherever we put a trail, people love it and they jump on it and they use it. And so we're excited to have that, that bit in place as well. So the biggest project in the history of Franklin is underway, and you don't get to see it much uh, every day, but it is the upgrade and expansion of our water reclamation facility uh, right by Franklin High School. It is expanding the capacity of that by 33%, moving from 12 to 16 million gallons. But it more importantly is enhancing our technology. It's already the one of, if not the highest performing wastewater treatment plants in the state of Tennessee, but we'll be adding additional technology to help us with treatment so that we maintain our, our stewardship of our environment and of the Harpeth River. So that will be completed pretty much a year from now. And elements of that are already starting to come online, but you'll see that fully completed in about a year. So that's a big one. Couple others to touch on, the Southeast Park. Uh, we have infrastructure work going on right now to build a bridge so that you can access that significant park area in Southeast Franklin. Again, one of our fastest growing areas. Provide an active park area as well as 
a passive park area around Robinson Lake. So that work is underway to get access to that site. And so that is, uh, we're excited to get that going. And that will also include our first fully inclusive playground facility. Um, so that is an exciting one and look for partnership opportunities with that project as well. Last thing on projects, we're working hard to design some other ones that are in the final and, and uh, early design stages for uh, the Long Lane Overpass, which uh, we're working on that design, as well as Columbia Avenue, which is a partnership with TDOT and uh, Federal Highways for that component. So that's kind of your project update. On operations, we talked a little bit about all the different things we've had to adapt to and deliver on, but our public safety team continues to perform at a very high level. Our police department added state accreditation to their international accreditation this past year. We provide crisis intervention training to every police officer every year in the city of Franklin because we know often our officers are walking into very difficult situations, helping people maybe in the worst day of their lives. And we want to equip them to do that and do that well. And uh, we're really proud of being on the leading edge of providing that kind of training. Also, their ability to understand, work with a wide variety of our citizenry that come from different experiences, different cultural backgrounds. We want them to understand that so that they relate and serve all of our citizens really, really well. Um, our streets department has an innovative way to treat and take care of our neighborhood streets, not just resurfacing all the time, but there's sealers and different treatments that we're using that will extend the life of neighborhood streets and stretch our dollars even further. Really proud of that creative solution. Um, our, our parks department continues to lead the way with lots of great services and, and we've used their parks and trails more than ever in this last year needing an outlet. Uh, and so we're just really uh, proud of that work, but also it showed the importance and value of those recreational outlets uh, to our community. And then finally, we're offering paperless billing for our utilities. So if you haven't signed up yet, you can get fully automated uh, your, your bill sent to you. You can set up your payments, all of that. We have already 6,500 of our, our utility customers have done that. So you can do that too. And our blue bin program, which we started, it seems like a lifetime ago, but it actually only started January 1 of 2020, already has 14,000 customers signed up to do that uh, curbside recycling. So that's great. Let's give that a hand. Our goal was 10,000, by the way. So uh, our, our citizens really stepped up, and uh, that's a great service that we're proud to provide as well. So that's my brain dump on all the stuff that's going on. There's more, trust me, but those are some highlights. I was starting to say, is that all that you've done this year, <laughs> Eric? Well, Mayor, now it's your turn. I'm going to ask you a question. It's not just about projects and services. It's about the people of the community and, and what's going on in the broader community is to, to be supportive of each other, to build a strong community. Talk a little bit about some of the things that, that you're involved in and that you see happening that will really move us forward in, in the year to come. Well, I, I appreciate your bringing those things up on things that we are doing to try to uh, improve our community, whether it's the health or just knowing who each other is in our community. Certainly Unite Williamson is still an active uh, group that's uh, trying to help us understand who our neighbors are and uh, what the differences are in each other. Uh, but this year we, uh, well actually last year, we started Find Hope Franklin whenever I appointed a blue ribbon panel to study mental health in our community. And from that has come a number of initiatives. And first is to uh, try to remove the stigma of mental health. Uh, we think that, I think that's an important thing for us to be able to have that conversation and certainly the pandemic has made it a little easier for us to talk about because I think we've all had our element of stress during this. Secondly, we have uh, more suicide in our community uh, than we need. One case is way too many. So we are working uh, through a grant from Vanderbilt and Franklin tomorrow to train people in QPR. Um, QPR is question, persuade, refer. And it's how do we equip you to recognize symptoms or questions or comments and how do you help someone that may be contemplating uh, taking their life. So uh, we've trained 11 trainers now 
And uh, we anticipate in July that we're going to roll this out to civic groups and small groups that have an interest in uh, being trained. Uh, my thought is if you know uh, CPR, you should know QPR. Um, I'm glad to say that uh, we'll be in unveiling the U.S. Colored Troop as part of the continuation of uh, the fuller story. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to do some preparation for the base for the uh, statue, but we look forward to that, that time later this year when we can unveil that as a community. And uh, recent action of, and by the way, uh, every member of the Board of Mayor and Alderman donated money to help fund that statue. So I, I appreciate their uh, help and leadership in that regard. Uh, recently, the Board of Mayor and Alderman voted to rename uh, two streets in our community. Uh, I, I, I call this some of the fuller story also. Uh, Second Avenue Extended, which that name's never made much sense to me. Uh, we have changed the name to Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. And then directly across the street, and it's okay to clap. Uh, <laughs> And if you look at the uh, street that goes between the Sonic and the old uh, water uh, department property, uh, that currently is just an alley, but it'll actually become a street as we develop the property there for what we call the Hill property. And we have named that ANC Williams Way. Um, an amazing story, a man that was born into slavery, became a free man, uh, opened a business on Main Street that lasted over 60 years. Uh, during the riot in Franklin in the early 1900s, uh, he participated in trying to quell the riot. The, uh, so uh, I think that's an appropriate um, uh, designation, and we look forward to continue telling more of the fuller story in Franklin. Um, and lastly, a new city hall. I know many of our staff are here, and uh, the ones that are clapping are my staff, <laughs> because uh, if you look up at the ceiling in city hall, uh, if it's raining, you're going to see some drips. If you don't, if it's not raining, you're just going to see a lot of water spots. Uh, this building has outlived its usefulness. Uh, we've looked at the opportunity to repurpose it. Uh, it's, we found that it's better to go ahead and build a new building. So we've started that process and we plan on doing that in phases as we approach it. Uh, you can go online at completethesquare.com and take the survey and talk about what you think the new city hall should have. Uh, so I invite you to uh, do that. Uh, there will be opportunities for more additional public input and so on. And then finally, uh, Juneteenth is coming up this year. This has been something that many of us have attended for many years over on uh, at the uh, Macklemore House. But this year uh, we have uh, dueling events, not dueling I guess, uh, we have partnering events at two historic sites. One will be unveiling of a historic plaque um, about the emancipation and the per person that announced that who has a Franklin connection and that'll be in Pinkerton Park and then downtown there will be a Juneteenth celebration also so uh, I urge you to attend those. So uh, I guess it's time to close and uh, I'm told I'm supposed to stand up, it's more dramatic, but uh, <laughs> um, first of all, I do want to thank the endurance of our hospitality industry, and I would encourage each and every one of you to go back to the restaurants, uh, encourage your friends to come visit and stay in the hotels. Uh, our healthcare workers, as Andy mentioned, many of them worked without a day off for many days. Uh, many of them experience things that on a frequent basis that none of us as healthcare professionals want to see on a regular basis. And again, the women and men of our fire and police department have worked above and beyond. 
I, I can't go without saying uh, something about a hole that was left in our Board of Mayor and Alderman when uh, Alderman Pearl Bransford passed away. Uh, she was a valuable component of our board. Uh, and after she was gone, I never realized how much she did in our community. Just, just way so many things. And through uh, Columbia State, a scholarship was uh, established. And Franklin Tamara collected the money and helped facilitate that. And over $45,000 has been raised to recognize Pearl and her contribution. There's certain things that uh, I feel very positive about. You know, I think as a community, we're, we're very well positioned for the economy as it continues to recover. Um, I see a lot of projects continuing to move forward and uh, we haven't stopped working during the pandemic. Uh, we want to continue to be a destination for people, and if you've been downtown lately, you've seen lots and lots of folks coming back, those leisure tourism folks. And also, I'd like to m just mention quickly that we're under Mayor Anderson's leadership beginning a uh, growth plan for the county for the future. Uh, so that'll be something that you'll be able to participate in. I can't say enough about the role of the Convention and Visitors Bureau, and uh, we're eager to help them come back full speed. Uh, we enjoy that $1.3 million a day that people spend in Franklin and Williamson County during good times. I know that the uh, Chamber is here. I appreciate their work and our business community and continuing to keep them strong. Uh, and lastly, uh, preservation is uh, always uh, in the back of my mind as uh, I see the Heritage Foundation and uh, their project, the Franklin Grove, which is the old Omar campus. Uh, this is invaluable to our community to have that piece of property preserved in the vision they have for it. And still there is um, uncertainty in our community, I, I guess. You know, uh, this is going to be a hard year. We've got an election. Uh, we'll have at least four new aldermen. Uh, we'll be filling uh, Alderman Bransford's seat in addition to four ward alderman seats. And so there is a lot of guessing out there about who's running, who's not running, but I urge everybody to get engaged with those campaigns and those people as we move forward. Uh, there are people already starting to guess about 2023 and what's going to happen. You know, we have a long-serving board. But I can tell you that in 2023, my name will be on the ballot. So, and I appreciate that. So, uh, appreciate y'all coming today. Just God bless every single one of you and your families. And let's hear from Franklin High School.